service, if you need some relief, you, you, you're welcome to use that restroom. I think we also have some water there as well. So um, we indulge your patience as we um, await the arrival of Brother Fellows so that we can start the service. Thank you so much. The wonderful things the Lord showed me there, I cannot describe. I saw their tables of stone, in which the names of the multitude of the redeemed were engraved in letters of gold. And after we beheld the glory of the temple, we went out, and Jesus left the city. Soon we heard his lovely voice again saying, Come, come, my people. You have come out of great tribulation and done my will. Suffered for me. Come in to suffer, for I myself will serve you. And we shouted, Alleluia, glory, and entered into the city. And I saw a table of pure silver. It was many miles in length, and yet our eyes could extend over it. I saw the fruit of the tree of life, the manna, almonds, figs, pomegranates, grapes, and many other kinds of fruit. And then Jesus said, you must go back to earth again and relate to others what I have revealed to you. And then an angel bore me gently down to this dark world. So 
Sometimes I think I can stay here no longer. All things of earth look so dreary. I feel lonely here, for I have seen a better place, a better land. So that I could fly away, I sail across the river shore ooh, to a better place. Oh, hallelujah, where there's sweet repose and the living water flows. the narrow way, on the narrow way, for I know the time is close at hand, for which I watch and pray, and that is today, today, today. On the narrow way, on the narrow way. 
All right, pleasant. Good morning, everyone. And before we have, we begin our funeral service this morning, we have just a few tributes, and we'll take those tributes now as they are printed in the program, and immediately following, we'll go right into the service. So we'll begin with the Brown Hill SDA Church, and we'll follow along as is printed in the program. We want to welcome you. The Brown Hill Seventh day Adventist Church is going to commence its tribute by way of a song. And I was asked to come before them. Bob and I became close friends on the day he was introduced to me by Sister Fellas, the late Sister Fellas. We grew so close that we did things together, working side by side, both at his place and mine. And those of us who are acquainted with the fellas' residence in church ground would understand what I'm talking about. The passageway that leads from the gate to the house it was not what it is now. And the entire yard, like on my defensing all around, those big boulders, they came from any and everywhere and from underneath. And they were like they aligned. He was humble. He was sincere. Associating with him taught me some valuable lessons. One, that to start life out with challenges is not a stumbling block to the right man. Two, it only makes him show what is within him. And three, what is abyss, death, danger to the man who wants to do something and does something about it? Waiting for something to come to you, nothing is going to come because those things do not just happen. We all have a giant in us and we need to wake him up. The brain which is crying out for work and action. Bob was an engineer all round up. And our friendship rallied the test of time, even to the end. A couple of Sabbaths, and I dare say many instead of a couple, when I absented from church, it was because I opted to be with Bob and to spend that time with him. He had reached a stage where he couldn't sit up very long 
not in the driver's seat. I remember the last time he went to Brown Hill Church, for example. When he was leaving, he got to his seat. And there was difficulty remaining very long. So he had to be home most of the time. And I thought it best to be with him on many of those occasions. And then he had a little problem with his heart too. So even when we were together at home, he couldn't sit up for very long, so you had to just give way to him to go and get his rest and relax and all that. My family and I express our deepest sympathy to Dr. Miranda, Kevin, Jonathan, and all the rest, the other members of the family. We pray that God would bless you and grant you the strength to hold on. It wasn't too long ago, just about two years ago, I stood right here in relation to your mother's passing. And now your father's passing. May God bless you and grant you the strength to hold on. And so, on behalf of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, Brown Hill, we will now sing a song which we hope will bring comfort to all of you, the family, Miranda, Jonathan, and your family, and all the other friends who are mourning his loss.
or any other gathering, and the folks say, good morning, church, and they don't like whatever they hear. Oh, come on, you can do better than that. Say good morning in church. Anyway, sorry. I'm Shirley Richardson. I am Jesus' sister, her only sister, only sister. And I have to look in the camera? Is that what you're telling me? Okay. If my children were here, they'd be very embarrassed and they're very annoyed. But I don't like to do what I'm told to do. Uh, anyway, let's get this going. Actually, why I'm here is only because I, am, I offered to read my son's tribute. Um, my son is Larry Henry, and he did the last tribute on the back page. And when I read it, and he sent it to me to ask for my opinion, I thought it would come over much better if it were read, and if you had some background to put it in the context. So um, I think what I'll do is I'll introduce it, and then I'll read it, and then I'll put some bits in that I think would go from me. Um, when my marriage ended and my children were with me, they went, I sent them to England from Toronto um, because I thought they needed some smiles and some love and whatever else. So Larry was missing his father. He was only about nine. And so um, this tribute, I think, from him comes from mainly that experience. And I remember Idris telling me that um, when they went hiking, as they did, oftentimes Larry would run up to Bob and hold on to his hand and continue walking with him. So much did he want that um, father feeling, I guess. And Bob apparently was Bob and just held on to his hand and kept going. Okay, so that's the context. And now I'm no longer able to read properly because I can't see. So. Bob's your uncle. It's an expression commonly used to say, and there you have it. But for Larry, it means more than that, and indeed it was true because Bob was his uncle. Uncle Bob, an adventurer, a builder. Um, yes, he was the original Bob the Builder. And I usually add Bob the Fixer, because there's a cartoon where it says, Bob, can we do it? Yes, we can. And Bob was that. He could look at a problem, think about it, and come up with solutions that probably nobody else could. He could fix anything. And I wonder now if I were to build a house in Nevis, as I promised to, who's going to help me do it? He was also a hiker a swimmer and an athlete, a writer and a bon vivant. Right, Brian? Remember your French? Yeah. Good. <laughs> okay. Despite being a published author, he was often a man of few words. Whether during our walks in the Malvern Hills or sitting in the shade of a mango tree in Nevis, he could often be found in quiet contemplation. I like to think that he was deep in thought planning his next adventure. But actually, a lot of the time, he just liked to be quiet. You know, Bob would enjoy sitting reading or just sitting, listening, and enjoying. He didn't always have to speak. From marrying a black woman in England in the 1970s, that was my sister, do you know how he met her? Was that said at the funeral for Idris? They met when Idris was a nurse, and he was a patient. I think he'd broken his leg, was it, Miranda? A knee injury. And so, well, I guess Idris must have liked him too, because they got together. Idris was the type who, when she wanted something, she got it. So I guess she wanted Bob, and he wanted her too. 
So despite what was going on in terms of racial situations in England in the 1970s, um, they got together. So from marrying a black woman in England in the 1970s to pulling up roots and moving with his family to the sunny shores of Nevis, he was not afraid to try something new and different. I can only imagine that once you have found the woman you love, nothing can scare you away from making her happy. Actually, Bob told me when I was here um, from November to January that marrying Idris was the best thing he did in his life. So, yes, I'm glad they were happy. They certainly were. Lots of pictures of them smiling and laughing and just being together. In fact, when Idris got ill, when I came down for my usual holiday, Bob was worn out. Does anybody have a tissue? Um, and um, I suggested, I suggested, suggested to him that he needed a holiday. I said, Bob, you know, go away. Go, I'll come back from Toronto and I'll be with Idris. I can look after her because you're worn out. He said, no, no, no. Idris was the one who planned holidays. She was the lively one. She was the one, the gregarious one who liked company and people. He said, I just went along with her and had a good time. So I can't imagine a holiday without her. But I, so I went back to Toronto. I said, anytime you need me, I'll come back. I was in Toronto for about a week. And he phoned and said that he's changed his mind and he would like to go. So he, he missed her dearly. So that love from the 1970s continued all through to the end. As Larry says, his love for his family was unmatched. From his grandchildren to his children, he showed pride and love for them in all that they did. However, his one true love was onto Idris. The pictures saw it all. Aunt Idris looking up lovingly into his eyes with a beaming smile on her face, and he can be seen looking back at her with joy in his eyes and a smile on his countenance. I'm not sure if I agree with the rest, but I'll read it. We can be comforted in the knowledge that they have found each other. Maybe I'll change that to the past tense. That they found each other, and that on that great getting up morning, hopefully they will be together one more time. So there you have it. I don't think I'm able to add any more now, so I'll take my seat. Good morning once again. I'm going to invite the congregation to stand as we have uh, the recessional, processional, sorry, processional. I'm reading from Psalm 91. The Bible declares, he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in him I will trust. Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with his feathers and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place. No evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra. 
the young lion and the serpent, you shall trample on the foot. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high, because he has known my name. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With a long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. On behalf of the members of the churches, Charlestown, Gingerland, and Brown Hill Seventh-day Adventist churches, um, I am Pastor Henry, and we offer to this family our deepest condolences, asking that God will continue to strengthen and comfort you in this time of loss. You may be seated. Good morning once again. My task this morning is to simply to say welcome to all who have gathered for this funeral service. I want to welcome in a special way um, the family members of the deceased, um, those, who, those who would have traveled from overseas to be here. I also want to recognize Miranda, Jonathan, Kefra, and the others who are here. We hope that through this service, as we reflect on the life of Robert, that we will all, you know, hold up, remember those precious memories that you would have shared with him. And I believe that these memories, as you, you know, live on, they'll help you carry you through as you face the days ahead. Death is not easy, it's never easy. And we have gathered here today, and we wish that we had come for different, under different circumstances. It's good that we have gathered, but we wish that the circumstances were different, but this is the reality that we face. So I extend to you my deepest condolences, and I pray that this simple service this morning will certainly be a blessing to all of us. So may God bless you as we continue with our service today. We will turn to our hymn sheet, and we're going to sing the first song. On our sheet, sing the one just love of Jesus, sing his mercy and his grace. In the mansions bright and blessed, he'll prepare for us a place. At the chord of the organ, let's all stand and sing this song. of him in glory when the boys of life repay when we are Soon his 
gates will open, we shall tread the streets of gold, when we have gone to heaven. What a day of rejoicing that will be, when we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Please remain standing. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Loving Father, we want to thank you for bringing us here safely this morning. As we come, dear God, to reflect on the legacy of Mr. Fellows and by extension, the family, we ask that you will breathe us in a special way, dear God. We ask that you will cover the family in a special way. May they feel and identify your presence, dear God. Father, despite the challenge, despite the the reality of the loss, which is not easy and it could never be easy, dear God. We ask that you will just soothe them in a special way. Father, we look forward to that day. That day when sickness and death and sin will die by itself. Can have that blissful moment in the presence of God. A moment that we cannot put a number to. Because for God, one day, it's like a thousand years. So, Father, even now I ask that you will bring comfort to the family and friends and well-wishers as we, we reminisce and as we reflect on what Mr. Fellows would have done, the legacy that he have left behind. We ask God that he will be one of a model for us, that we can live with the assurance that he would have done all that he, he, he could have possibly done on this side of heaven to ensure that he had and will remain in the comfort of the assurance of God. So we ask, dear God, that you will just have your way this morning in Jesus' loving name. And please be seated. At this time, I'm going to call on Dr. Miranda Fellows. As she brings to us the scripture reading, which comes to us from Matthew chapter 27. And she's going to read from verse 36 to verse 40. And after, just after Dr. Miranda would have finished her scripture reading, we'll have special music by Sister Joya Clark. So after Dr. Fellows, Sister Joya will come and do her rendition. Thank you. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Thank you for coming as we celebrate my dad's life. And it is with loss and sadness we're here, but also to rejoice and to celebrate a man of integrity, perseverance, and love. He taught what it is to have a family that loves and to be devoted to family. And I, I love my dad. So this is an appropriate scripture, I feel, because it's all about love. And I will read it so I get it verbatim. Matthew chapter 22, verses 36 to 40. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. And I think with mum and dad, they had a lot of differences. Racial beliefs and certain things. There's a lot of differences, but they loved each other and they loved God. And they made it work. And it's beautiful to see through ups and downs, they always stuck together. And such an example for all of us. Thank you.
is no pain Jesus can feel no hurt he cannot heal all things work according to his power No matter what you're going through, remember God is there for you, for the battle is not yours, it's the Lord. There's no sadness Jesus can't feel And there is no sorrow That he cannot heal For all things work According to the master's holy will No matter what you're going through Remember God is there for you For the battle is not yours It's the Lord's It's the Lord's Yes, it's the Lord's Hold your head up high Don't fight It's the Lord's You're going through Remember God Is there for you No matter what You're going through Remember God Is there for you No matter what You're going through The battle is not yours, no, the battle is not yours, the battle is not yours, no, the battle is not yours, the battle is not yours It's the Lord's right, At this time we are going to have the eulogy done um, by Jonathan Fellows and Kefra Grandison. Okay. Um, as they are coming, we want to recognize the presence of uh, Mr. Troy Lybert, um, the minister. Thank you so much for being here. Um, and uh, you, you can come. You can come. Um, after the eulogy is done, um, Pastor Otis Brown, pastor for the second district for the Seventh-day Adventist Church, um, in Nevis will deliver uh, the word. So following the eulogy, 
the next voice you'll hear is Pastor Otis Brown. Thank you. Hello. Well, we're all, uh, we all know why we're here today, celebrating the life of Robert Fellows. Some, some of you would know him as uh, Mr. Bob, uh, or just Bob. Um, he was born on the uh, 20th of June, 1949, in Dudley, in England. And he went on to attend Dudley Grammar School. He took an apprenticeship in Garrington's, which was a, a, a factory, GKN factory, in Bromsgrove, where his mother was working doing the accounts. Uh, he continued to work there as a work-study engineer. And then, as we've heard from uh, Auntie Shirley, he, he met, uh, met Mum when uh, he was in hospital for a knee operation. And, um, and he, fell, he fell in love with Idris. Again, yeah, Dad said that meeting Mum was the best thing that happened in his life. And, uh, yeah, Dad was devoted to Mum. And his love language was, was in building and maintaining and repairing and keeping things in order. He was a grandfather to Miranda's children, Kefra, Elijah and Ethan, and to my children, Jasmine, Hannah and Luke. And more recently, a great-grandfather to Sonny, Hannah's son. When we lived in Bromsgrove, I have early memories of Dad walking to work. And on the weekends, we'd go for a walk on the Licky Hills. Sometimes we'd even take a toboggan if it snowed. Our summer holiday back then would be uh, camping in Cornwall. Dad would spend time fixing our bikes and working on, we had a VW Beetle back then, uh, which kind of, kind of need, needed often tinkering with. And mum would often crash it as well, so <laughs> it needed the bumps bashing out as well. Uh, and he'd keep the garden tidy. He was also involved in an amateur dramatics group. In, uh, in 1984, he and Mum purchased uh, the old vicarage in Malvern and uh, they converted it into a care home for the elderly. Dad had been made redundant from Garrington's and although he had uh, he'd retrained in computer programming, um, once the care home plans had been finalised, he was wholeheartedly involved in all aspects of building and running the business there. Um, they bought a house in Morningstar on Nevis in, I think it was 1989, and um, they had the dream of eventually retiring on Nevis. Dad was possibly even more excited than Mum about the prospect, and he would break away from, from work at the care home and come to Nevis for four months at a time to prepare a place for when they retired. Dad did the majority of the building work, including putting together a, a system for solar hot water. In 1995, they sold up everything in the UK and came to be in, in Nevis full time. Dad has always been a quiet person, very practical and knowledgeable about how things work. Um, on the surface, it might have seemed like he was quite pessimistic. I suppose he saw all the issues with the problems um, to start off with, and then with persistence and determination, he would make things happen. Dad had a, a very British sense of humour, which was quite dry, and uh, it was a joy to see him laughing at uh, John Cleese-style scenarios. And uh, also reminding him of sort of family in-jokes, often stemming from uh, some of the characters in the uh, care home, would, uh, would crack him up. Um, he'd also make us laugh with his, his playful um, foreign and regional accents that he'd kind of bring out. Um, 
Dad spent a lot of time reading for pleasure, but he also put a huge chunk of time into researching, writing and publishing his book, No More Sea, which is about codes within the Bible. Um, there was a stability to life, knowing Dad was there for advice and uh, a vacuum now he is gone. Um, and is the example that he set remains with us. Thank you. Okay, hi everyone. I'm Kefra, Robert Fellows' grandson. Today we gather in honorable memory of my grandpa, aka Mr. Fix It, a man whose legacy will forever be etched in our hearts and minds. As we reflect on his journey, we are reminded of the immense impact he had on all of us and all who are fortunate enough to meet him. My grandpa had the my grandpa was the epitome of resourcefulness, a true jack of all trades. He could fix anything with his hands and a few tools. From tinkering in his workshop to solving complex problems, he approached every challenge with unwavering determination and a can-do attitude. His, his resourcefulness was not just a skill, but a testament to his resilience in the face of adversity. Yet, admit, yet amidst his busy life, he was always made time for those he loved. He was a caretaker in every sense of the word, offering unwavering support, guidance, and love to his family and friends. His nurturing spirit touched the lives of many, leaving an impactful mark, impactful mark on all who had a privilege of knowing him. As we all know, he lived a very healthy life, which my grandma also did, which is why it may be very strange that they left us many years before they were supposed to. It seems painfully ironic that Mr. Fixit could not fix himself, neither could the medical professionals. Despite the dislike of America, he persevered through a trip, through trials and tribulations to find a solution to prolong his life, to see his great-grandchildren and my brother Ethan, who was also known as his My Happiness, right before he passed. Our family would like to give a very heartfelt, heartfelt thanks to Auntie Indy for all the hard work, dedication, and love she's given to the family for many years. Especially during his last few months when she nursed him in his bed and allowed him to pass away with dignity as he was surrounded with his family. Thank you so much, Auntie Indy. As we all bid farewell, let us not let us take control. As we bid farewell, let us take comfort in the knowledge that his legacy will live on through the values he instilled in each of us. Let us honor his memory by embracing his spirit of resourcefulness, hard work, and care for others. Though he may no longer be with us in body, his legacy will endure for the generations to come, and his memory will be forever cherished, cherished forevermore. Thank you. Love you, Grandpa. Your grandson, Kefra. For the third time, good morning. That was certainly a meaningful and heartwarming um, tribute. And I pray that God may continue to comfort you based on what was said um, it seems as though I can say that uh, Mr. Fellows was certainly a good man, a family man, one who looked out for his family. And it is great that we can come and you know, reflect on all of his good qualities. Today I'm privileged to be able to speak a word from God. Um, this is Pastor Henry's congregation, um, but he has asked me to fill in, and I'm happy to do so. I'm also happy to be able to serve with Pastor um, Sean Simmons, who is here with us, along with Elder Egbert from the Brown Hill Seventh-day Adventist Church. I was told by Miranda that um, Robert was a simple man, simple, straightforward, you know, what you see was what you get, not an impressionist in any way. And so my hope is that um, this sermon would be a reflection of that, simple, straight to the point, just to share some thoughts, and I hope that it would help us as we face the days ahead. 
Let us pray. Heavenly Father, simply ask that you may speak through me in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to reflect on Job chapter 1, and I'll read two verses. The Bible says in Job chapter 1, verse 20 and 21, the word of God says, Then Job arose, tore his robe, and shaved his head, and fell to the ground and worshipped. And he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, naked shall I return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. We all agree that death is never easy to confront. When a loved one dies, despite the circumstances, we are left with questions. Why? Even when we have deemed that the person has lived a full life, we are still left wondering why. Today, as family members, friends, associates, church members, we have gathered with sorrow in our hearts to say goodbye. And I could imagine that for the family members who are here, this is a, quite a difficult moment. And sometimes moments like these causes, cause us sorry, to ask the question, why? Why now? Why not another year? Why? Now, I must confess that I do not have the answer to any of these questions, but I believe that there are some lessons that we can derive from looking at the life of Job. The Bible tells us that Job was a rich man, unlike Pastor Brown. He, his life was one of abundance. He lacked nothing, the Bible says. And in addition to all of his earthly possessions, the Bible says the Lord also blessed him with children. His quiver was full. And all that he had was as a result of God's favor on his life. In addition to this, the Bible tells us that Job was a blameless and upright man. He was a good man, one who feared God and one who shunned evil. But through the providence of God, which we often cannot understand, God allowed Job to lose all that he had all at the same time. He lost his possessions. He lost his children. His property was destroyed. Could you imagine losing all that you have all at once? Job lost it all. But it was at this point of tragedy and loss that his faith in God shined through like never before. Despite the chaos that happened in his life, Job was able to make a profound acknowledgement. After having torn his garment and after he shaved his head, which was a sign of his grief, he declares, the Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amidst Job's tragedy, he acknowledged that God ultimately has the final say. He trusted that whatever God does, he does it well. While he did not understand why this was happening to him, he did not have a clue, yet he trusted the heart of God. It is difficult to understand why God does what he does or why he allows what he allows. But our faith in God informs us that God knows exactly what he is doing. And though we do not know why, we know that the ways of God are always perfect. The Bible declares in Isaiah 55 verses 8 and 9, the Bible says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Job acknowledged that the Lord is the one who gave, gave him all that he had, his wealth, his children, and even his health. And so today, 
I submit to you, family members in particular, loved ones who have gathered, that the Lord is the one who gave brother fellows to you. And while you are in the midst of your grief, I want us to take a moment to pause, acknowledge, and thank God for giving. He was given to the family, and in those years he was here, and based on what we would have heard so far, he made tremendous contributions to this family. He was given as a father, a grandfather, a husband. He was given as a friend. And as we have paused to reflect on his life, let us also give God thanks for the fact that he gave. The Lord gave him to this family and the family was blessed through him. And we have to always pause and as we reflect, let us give God thanks for his life, for the years that he lived, for the contributions that he has made. But the difficult part of the text is not the fact that the Lord gives. The difficult part is the fact that he also takes away. It is easy to celebrate what God gives, but it is hard to celebrate when he takes away. But I declare to you today that the God who has the prerogative to give also has the prerogative to take away. And this is often difficult to accept. The Lord gave brother fellows and the Lord has allowed him to be taken away. He is gone. In a few moments, his body will be laid to rest. He'll be resting in the grave until the return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who shall come to take all his faithful children home. He will no longer be around, unfortunately. He is gone. The Lord has allowed him to be taken away. But what should your response be? I want to submit to you as I close today that you can choose to leave here bitter, broken, and bewildered by the reality of his passing. Or like Job, you can declare, the Lord gives and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Job recognized that the name of God is worthy of praise no matter what he chooses to do. When God blessed Job, Job declared that the name of God is worthy to be praised. But also when Job lost it all, when he lost everything, including his precious children, he also declared that the name of God is worthy to be praised. And I submit that this should be our attitude. So despite of the reality before us, the name of God is still blessed. And I encourage you to celebrate the life that Robert lived. Be thankful for the time that God gave him to the family. Be thankful for the positive impact that he would have left. Be thankful for the legacy that he would have created over the years of his life. Cherish the precious memories that you've shared over the years. Cherish them. Hold on to them. For despite the sting of death, we can continue to place our trust in God. We can continue to hold on to his promises. We can have confidence that the affairs of this earth, life and death, are in the hands of a loving and merciful God. I want to leave with you this passage of scripture found in Isaiah chapter 41, verse 10. The word of God says, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you, yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. I want to suggest that you take this promise as if it was written to you alone. God is saying to you, he is with you. He will strengthen you and he will uphold you. So may God continue to bless you and may God comfort you, especially as you face the days ahead. Amen. Can we stand for the benediction? I want to thank 
Pastor Brown for speaking to our hearts this morning. And I pray that those words will linger with you, the family, and all of, the, all of us who are here as we continue to go through these trying moments. I will read from a passive I will read a passive scripture for you for benediction from Romans chapter 15 verse 13 and it says may God may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Ghost May God bless you. I would like you to take your hymn sheet and we're going to sing our recessional song. Oh Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder, consider all the words the world thy hands have made. I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout. The universe display.
service. And invite us before we go any further to more of it for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we bow at this moment in time. We look to you as our source, as our help, and our source of strength. Pray for the family in this time and as we're about to lay body to the ground, we do so with the confidence and assurance that there is hope in Jesus Christ. And so we pray that you may be with this part of this ceremony. from 1 Corinthians 15, 51 to 58. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption. And this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality. Then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written. Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain. For as much as God in his infinite lovers and wisdom has permitted our brother Robert Fellows to fall asleep. We do tenderly return him to the ground. Earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, in the sure and certain hope that when our Lord and Savior Jesus returns to this world, all those who have made a commitment with Jesus Christ shall see him once again. With these words, I do comfort all stand here remembering the word that was declared the Lord has given the Lord has taken away let us bless the name of the Lord bow your heads with me as I offer a word of prayer Father God we thank you O Lord for your kindness towards us for blessing all who stand here with the opportunity to be touched by this man's life Lord we recognize that we are all sinners, and though this man may not have been perfect, we recognize that he has surrendered his life to you. And we pray, O oh God, our hope is that when you return, he will see you and his family once again. With this hope in mind, we ask, O oh God, that you will mark this spot. Let an angel from heaven just mark this particular spot, so that when that great getting up morning comes, we who are here will be assured by the hope that one day soon, as we are faithful to you, O oh Lord, we will see Robert Fellows again. May we be blessed and comforted by your word and by this hope. In Jesus' name.
that love the Lord, and let our joys be known. Join in a song with sweet accord. Join in a song with sweet accord. And thus surround the throne. We are marching to Zion. Yeah, we 
in power, power, one the walk in power in the blood, the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, one the walk in power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Amen. There is a land that is fewer than thee, and by faith we can see it afar. Father waits over the way to prepare us a dwelling place there. In the sweet by and by, we shall meet on that beautiful shore. This is hymn number 428 in the 7th hymnal. Let us sing this one like this. Oh, we ransom him 
and the step me by His grace. In His glory, I shall see the King and forever. And this place is seen towards the Calvary. Jesus died for me. I shall see the King so. service we want to thank everyone who was involved we want to extend once again to the family members our best please on behalf of the church we want you to know that in this moment of bereavement we are praying for you and you can feel free to reach out to any of us if you need any additional support we wish you god's blessings especially as you face the days ahead at this time i invite us to bow our heads as we have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we bow once again in your presence to simply say thank you for the life that Brother Fellows lived. We thank you, Lord, for his family and for the fact that they have gathered here to say their goodbyes. Dear Lord, going forward, we know they will miss their dad. We know, God, that many will miss their friend we know that the grandchildren will miss their granddad we just pray that you may buttress them comfort them and give them the strength that they need to face the days ahead dear lord as we have laid his body here we have done so with a sense of hope because the word of god declares that one day jesus christ will return and he will take his faithful children home. So until that day, we pray that we may remain faithful to you. In Jesus' name.